How's it going, everyone? I'm Owen Fitzpatrick, an Irish psychologist. I've written eight books, done a TEDx talk, and I've been a listener of the What You Will Learn podcast for the last couple of years. I'm a huge fan. My own podcast is called Changing Minds with Owen Fitzpatrick. I interviewed Adam and Adam recently, where we spoke about our favorite books, interviews, and the best lessons we've ever learned. If you enjoy what you'll learn, you'll love this interview. I've also episodes about the work of authors like Robert Greene, Dale Carnegie, interviewed some like Nir Eyal and Tom Ziegler, son of Zig. And I've also episodes on CBT, NLP, and why some people believe conspiracy theories. I'm looking at you, Ash, though. Anyway, check out my show, Change Your Minds, on your favorite podcast player. It's also at changeyourmindspodcast.com. Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of How to Lie with Statistics by Daryl Huffman. The big Huffman. He starts with a quote from Benjamin Disraeli, UK Prime Minister of the 1800s. And Disraeli said, there are three types of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. So basically, they're saying that stats are mostly a crock of shit. Mm. You can use them to your advantage or you can be fooled by them. Obviously, we don't want to be getting sucked in. So we're going to fight back against these lies. There's a story here in Britain when they were talking about changing over the imperial system to the metric system. So they were doing a whole bunch of studies and polls and everyone had their vested interest in what they thought they really wanted. And there was this Gallup poll and they found that 33% of people, they'd never heard of the metric system. Mm. But then another poll from the Sunday paper, they found that 2% of readers had never heard of the metric system. So two different polls with a 16 and a half times difference in what the result was. So what the hell is going on? Yeah, exactly. It's, it just goes to show that there are many ways to manipulate stats in your favor. One was saying the Gallup poll was a, was a pretty good broad cross-section of the whole society and so they captured views pretty accurately whereas a Sunday paper was you had to snip out a coupon, fill it out, send it back in and say, yes, you knew about it or no, you didn't know about it. So obviously, if you're going to snip out a coupon, if you didn't know what the hell the metric system was, why would you snip out the coupon and send it back in saying, no, I don't know what it is? So obviously, there's a bit of bias in the sample size there showing that uh, the way that you collect stats has a big impact on the result. So that's a bit of a, it seems meaningless this kind and trivial, this kind of example. Ma- meaningless and also very old as well. We should say this book's about like 70 years old, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's a very old book. <laughs> it's held up pretty well, I think. It's held up pretty well. A yeah. few, of these, few of the examples, not so much, which we'll, which we'll cover. But almost every time when people present these statistics, they're framing it as, oh, yeah, we've been objective. Hmm. But deep down, if you just look a bit harder, it's entirely manipulated and right, like a factor difference of 16 and a half times in some things. It's just, a, as you were saying, it's just a crock of shit. Mm, exactly. So this book um, written in the 1950s is designed to be the uh, antidote to all these lies that are told through statistics. The author says that the crooks already know the tricks, so the honest man must learn them for self-defense. Or of course, if you want to learn them and use them to take advantage of other people, that's another way you can use it. Use and, the stats. Yeah, you can be a, a bit of a crook like like old Ash show over here <laughs> and uh, use it for your own benefit. So in this episode, what we're going to cover is sampling errors and bias sampling, the different types of averages you might use, how an unrelated stat can be used to explain a different question and how you can fight back against all these dodgy statistics everyone's throwing towards you. Let's say you got a barrel full of beans, some of them red, some of them white, and you wanted to know how many were of each color within this barrel in terms of proportions. The only way to get 100% certainty about the exact figure is you pull them all out and you count every single bean, each one red and each one right. But this might take a lot of time, might be a bit of a pain in the ass counting each one. So you might look to do a shortcut. A shortcut might be you put your hand in, you grab a full handful of it and you take it out and then you count how many are red and how many are white and then based on that, you assume it's the same for the rest of the population. So if you take a large enough handful that's selected properly, then you might get something that is relatively accurate to what it is. But you can really cook up your estimations based on these two factors, it not being large enough and it not being selected properly. So we're talking here about sampling biases. You might be able to trick yourself and the people reading that you've got this scientific method where you've you know selected a, a great group of people and by extrapolating this you've got a, a really good understanding of the whole but even though it sounds good you can be way off the mark one uh, obvious uh, a bit of a gag example is a questionnaire saying do you like to answer questionnaires and the researcher found that almost 100 percent of people <laughs> like to answer questionnaires but of course 
the only people that are going to answer the questionnaire are the people, people who like questionnaires. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that's obviously a, a, a very biased sample there. So you've got to be very careful with how you select your sample. There's another few here that are a little politically incorrect <laughs> given these were written in 1950s. Sometimes a bit of that happens. There's a psychiatrist saying pretty much everyone is crazy. Yeah. Their sample is obviously going to be pretty biased. Pretty biased the- towards uh, <laughs> slightly crazy people. And then there's another one here which is even more politically incorrect but... There's a cartoon in the book of a plastic surgeon saying that all women's boobs are weird and or small. <laughs> That's, again, obviously, the sample is very biased because the, the types of people going to see the plastic surgeon uh, have a very specific uh, set of interests that they want to uh, overcome, but probably doesn't stand up 70 years later. I don't think something get, you should be putting in a book. <laughs> yeah, that, that, uh, that gag didn't really age well. <laughs> Not at all. They've got an example here of a, a, a survey that was framed as this really scientific research where they published this in the, in the newspaper saying that over 4 million Americans converted from Catholicism to Protestantism. And the, the way that they got to this 4 million figure was they sent out a poll to 25,000 Protestant ministers and 2,000 of them said, hey, we've had 40,000 conversions from Catholicism to Protestantism. Yeah, I wonder who are... Uh, so you got 23,000 who just didn't bother... F- Writing That's and it. filling it back, and only a couple of thousand it's out of the twenty five thousand did. Yeah, and so they're saying, okay, well, let's okay. So two thousand people have said uh, we've, that we've had forty thousand conversions. So if you extrapolate that, and you know, if every minister has, is having that same average rate of conversions, we get to something close to four million conversions. And that's just obviously one very positive way of looking at it, uh, assuming that they told the truth, even though there's probably a bit of incentive for them to fudge their own numbers and, and bump the numbers up a little bit to make themselves look better. And they're just saying, okay, here's the average rate, let's extrapolate that and we get to 4 million. The other way of looking at it is saying, well, of those 23,000 that didn't reply to it, maybe they had zero. And if you extrapolate those numbers, you're nowhere near that 4 million mark. So depending on how you spin the stats up, you can get very, very different answers. Yeah, in each case, the the bias is really unavoidable in, in that kind of survey. I was recently asked to provide feedback on, on something. So the Green Building Council here in Australia, they're looking to review all their rating tools about how they review how you know sustainable some buildings are. And they sent it out to all of industry. And then obviously the people who are the biggest most enthusiastic, mm. loyal supporters of the Green Building Council, they were the, the ones who actually supported and actually provided the feedback on the survey. Mm. Anyway, as, you, as you'd imagine after reading this book, after all the results came back, it was the <laughs> results were 99.9% <laughs> of people support all the changes that we're making in industry. Exactly. Like, oh, hang on. <laughs> 99.9% Nine percent of all the people who already support you are the ones who are supporting you. <laughs> Correct. So the, again, a built-in bias. Exactly, and I think it probably goes the other way as well. You know, like the, any of those customer service feedback surveys. I'd say a big chunk of people who just have a normal experience don't answer it. The only ones who send back feedback are the ones who are really pissed off, who had a really bad experience. And then obviously the average of those people looks pretty bad. Yeah, there's one here from our man Huff. He tells of a story. Back in the class of 24, so we're going, <laughs> going Not 2024, years. <laughs> 1924, yeah. The average Yale man makes, <laughs> no, the average Yale manage. man makes 25,111 pounds a year. That's a, that's, a, that's a lot, man. In 1924 money, and we're talking pounds, it's something like one and a half million dollars of, of 2020 money. Yeah, and you can imagine back in the day, it would be very hard to find these people. So, the ones <laughs> yeah. who got the beautiful addresses and they're making it to the <laughs> newspapers, they're probably just surveying the, the top class of society. The one who's just pulling beers and just some of them might be homeless. Some All these kind of people <laughs> who aren't making anything, again, they're not making it into the sample. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's very easy to, to, to fudge those numbers either through, again, if you're self-reporting what your income is, you're probably going to bump it up a little bit as well. And as you say, the types of people who you're asking this question to is really going to affect the numbers that you get as well. So, the kicker here is unless the sample is truly representative of the population as a whole from which every potential source of bias has been removed, then the study, it's basically effectively useless. If you're looking for objective results, if you're looking to skew the results and make <laughs> things look at uh, self-serve what you're looking to get, then you could obviously just cherry pick a few of the, the, the you know population before you go in there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he says it has to be representative. It doesn't mean that it has to be exactly 50% men, 50% women, exact split of religions, incomes, number of people in the family, level of education. It doesn't have to be exactly... Uh, representative of society but what it means is that everybody has to have the right chance to be able to be included in that study so when we're looking at the the rich Yale blokes from the 1920s 
if the only people's address they had were the rich ones and they didn't have the address of the bloke who's living on the street, that person did not have a chance to get into the study. So, for in order for stats to be in any way meaningful, everybody has to have an equal chance of being part of this random sample. Let's imagine you're chatting to a real estate agent about wanting to buy a house in a new neighborhood. The estate agent, she says, the average income in this neighborhood is about $10,000. And again, this is pounds in 1950, so decent amount of dough back then. And so you have to tell all your friends when you buy the house how well off the area is, all your neighbors, <laughs> sure. you're in the richest neighborhood going around. <laughs> and then a few months later, what happens? You go to a town hall meeting and the council wants to increase the rates and taxes for the local area. And you protest because they say the average income is only $2,000. You're like, what the hell's happened here? I was told not long ago, I'm with all these rich, cool people earning 10,000 pounds a year, and now you're saying 2,000 pounds. Like, who were you lying back then, or you're lying now? Mm. Yeah, well, if you're uh, if you're clever, then when you're the real estate agent, and you want to sell a house. Obviously, you're going to pick one average, and uh, when you're trying to fudge your taxes a little bit, you're going to pick a different average. So, in actual fact, both of these were actually true. One was just using the mean as the average, and one was using the median as the average. So, the difference here is that one is you know the the 50th percentile, whereas one is the the arithmetic average where you add everything up and divide by how many there are. And in some cases, if you have a normal distribution or a bell curve, the mean and the median are the same. So, that's things like human characteristics, like people's height. Most people are somewhere in the middle. You've got a few really tall people, you've got a few really short people, but you haven't got anyone that's one centimeter tall, you've got no one that's 100 meters tall, everyone's sort of clumped around the middle. And in that case, the mean and the median are pretty similar, but some data is skewed, like say income, you're going to have most people are clumped around, you know, 50 to $100,000 a year, then you've got the, the big CEOs that are on 6 million a year, and then you've got the big entrepreneurs who are on, on 100 million a year. So this data is very skewed. And in this case, the mean and the median could be two very different numbers. Let's say you're the principal of a school, for example, and your income given from the government is based on the performance of your students in the class. And they're asking, you know, what's the average performance of everybody? In it, you got a whole bunch of people in the 70s, 80s, 90s. You got a couple of people who are scoring 100, like old Ash over here. <laughs> then also, you got all those drop kicks who are just taking the piss and they're getting to zero on their tests and just not even writing their name and draw, drawing dick pics on the, <laughs> on the back of the, the page. So, how would you play that one, Ash? Well, it depends. If you're if you're saying that uh, most people are sort of clumped around that eighty percent, then the median is going to be somewhere in the middle there. The bloke who didn't even show up that day, he's he's got zero. He's dragged down the mean phenomenally. So I'd say I'd be I'd be sticking with the median now. I think the median would be higher than the mean because you can't really get higher than one hundred percent if everyone's clumped around the top. That zero really drags down the the mean. So let's stick with the median to get a bit more cash out of the government. Well, you might even just say, "Hey, there's a few outliers here, and just, just cut it." <laughs> <laughs> you do some of that, I think. <laughs> but yeah, the maybe you can make an adjusted mean where you throw out the, the blokes at the bottom of the class and just and go with a new mean. Yeah. Create your own. So whenever you hear someone says, Oh yeah, the average was X, always think twice and think what are they trying to achieve by using the average. And then, you know, if you're a little bit critical, you need to ask, is this the average of what? How did they calculate it? Who is the average? And so forth. And understand if it's something that fits on the normal distribution, it doesn't really matter. But if it's something that you know where the results are skewed, they're obviously cherry picking. And if you're the someone who's dealing with results that are skewed, you might as well cherry pick the one that's, <laughs> that's going to serve you the best. A quote from the book the author says, If you can't prove what you want to prove, then demonstrate something else and pretend that they're the same thing. <laughs> That's a pretty good, <laughs> pretty oh, good method if you, want to, if you want to manipulate statistics. He says there's one example here is uh, they're trying to talk about the, the benefits of this new medicine that cures the common cold. And you've published this lab report where you've got this female scientist in the lab coat looking up intensely at this test tube and, and the headline says that this active ingredient in our medicine killed 31,108 germs in a test tube in under 11.5 seconds. And looking at that, it looks pretty legit. Mm -hmm. It looks like, man, this is some serious medicine. But they haven't actually said, if you take this medicine, it will cure your cold. All they've said is in a test tube, our medicine killed a bunch of germs. Now, it sounds like that's pretty good stuff, but it doesn't really demonstrate what you're actually trying to demonstrate. They just picked something else and made it look like it was the same thing. Yeah, there's a few of those ads on TV, isn't there? A lot of those kills 99% yeah. of, <laughs> of germs within 10 Maybe like 
germs just pop in and out of existence <laughs> anyway, and it's and the grease is still there. And it's all, yeah, it's also very different. Like if you if you're in a lab and you got a test tube and you the, you've got a tub of germs and you put the shit in the tub, then obviously it's going to kill everything. But if it's very different to if you're cleaning a kitchen and everything's spread out and there's, it's not a really controlled environment. Yeah, so they're obviously injecting a little bit of influence here, authority, using a famous name and a photo of a scientist in a lab coat always adds a bit of salt and pepper mm. to make things a little bit more believable. So another way you can use the semi-attached figure and a lot of people use it is through the before and after effect. Now, a popular example is if you got the photo of a living room before and after to show the benefits of the new point, always make the before shot, have a dark and gingy and just your, mm. your dirty socks line in the back corner. <laughs> then the after, your professional lighting, new paint, new furniture, fireplace, smiling people, laughing kids in the background and obviously it makes it much better but you're really measuring it on based on things that had nothing to do with the exact change that you made to the room. If it was perfectly sampled, you have the exact same lighting and everything else and then just the small difference between mm. the before and after. Exactly. Same as any of those, you know, lose weight fast, any of those magic machines that you see on TV or the, the special pill that make you lose weight and they see the before and after photo of somebody and they've lost so much weight. Obviously, before, it's this black and white photo. They look depressed. Their shoulders are a hunch. They've probably just drunk a two-liter bottle of Coke and they're fully bloated. Uh, you can you can tell that from below, the, they've got this double chin and the shadows are not flattering at all. And then after that, they've used this magic machine and taken these magic pills, they've lost so much weight. It's full color. They're standing up straight, a big smile professional lighting it's taken from slightly above them so you can't quite see that double chin anymore and they probably haven't eaten or drunk anything for the last week so they're looking super super thin another aspect of the semi-attached figure is the compared to what so this also happens on a lot of uh, advertisements on tv uh you got an example here back then it was uh, the juice master 5000 extracts 26 percent more juice as verified by independent laboratory tests by the Princeton Testing Lab <laughs> and vouched for by the Good Housekeeping Institute. The, the big question here is, it says it extracts 26% more juice, but 26% more than what? Is that just from you mushing it together with your hands? Or is that like, <laughs> you know, it could be 26% more than anything. Uh, it's not necessarily saying that this is 26% better than the next best option. It's just saying it's 26% better than, than some random thing that they've picked out. Another example here, new planes are more dangerous than old planes. More people were killed in airplane crashes in 1950 than in 1910. You probably say the same in 2020, right? Mm. More in 2020 than 1910. Mm. And you think, all right, I'm not going to hop in. Yeah. I'm not going to hop in any, any airplane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's just saying that uh, there's obviously missing a big chunk of that, and that's saying that well, yeah, there's more deaths and there's more crashes. That's because there's so many more planes flying around. Uh, that obviously in 1910, there's only, I don't know, there's probably a, a few people who've got a, a little airplane in their backyard, but in 1950, that's when they've got the commercial plane. So there's a, so many more people flying, so many more flights each day, and with that comes uh, a few more crashes. Mm. And I think there's a bit of a base rate neglect here if you wanted to go to the next level mm. of just looking at this. They're obviously not looking at what the total population was. They're just looking at the numerator and not the denominator whatsoever. Matt, I would say that I'm a bit of a um, master manipulator when it comes to stats. Hopefully none of... So working at Digital Marketing Agency each month, we do our monthly reports of how everything's gone for the last Man, month. I'm just going to say, hopefully you're, if your boss starts listening to this podcast, I don't think you're going to last very long. No, if the boss listens, it's okay. If, I think if the clients are listening, <laughs> that's probably where, if that's when it's getting more dodgy. But generally, there's always something positive you can you can spin. You know, if uh, normally, uh, you know, you're looking at the traffic, has the traffic gone up? And normally, if it has, that's great. Uh, if it hasn't gone up, then maybe you can just... Maybe not traffic. overall. Maybe it's like a percentage-wise it went up if it's a if it was a shorter month or something. Or you know if that didn't work, then I'll compare the month not to the previous month but to the same month last year and over twelve months. And yeah, it's gone up. Or maybe you, if the traffic hasn't gone up, maybe you can say well the engagement went up instead. Or maybe you can say that okay this this didn't go up overall, but this one thing that we really wanted to do this one went up. Uh, so it's a, it's always you can always pick something positive. I think to to cherry pick something so the reports every single month are always positive. Yeah, I noticed this uh, with our podcast stats, especially early days. I've been looking at the how many people are listening to the podcast and everything. And I'm like, mate, our stats are down on last month. <laughs> and then every single time we manage to just leave that conversation as if it's just going up. You just there was always, pick well, something there was else. Something. Well, maybe if it was, you know, the maybe the numbers are down, but. 
you know, each day they went up or something, you know, rather than maybe for the whole month they were down, but if it was a shorter month percentage wise, day by day was actually higher, or maybe we had more email signups, or maybe that, you know, if, if iTunes or Apple Podcasts went down, but Spotify went up, there's, there's always something positive you can spin out of it, I think. Yeah, when I, I do an, another podcast subcontracting for uh, Wood Solutions, Timber Talks, anyone listening, probably not worth listening to, it's not off your alley. But anyway, when I was reporting back stats on how well it's going to get the funding for the new season, the outcome I wanted is to look like the stats were growing. Mm. Now, if I chose the same dates for each year, it would have, would have said a different story where the compared to if I just changed the dates a little bit around and it was kind of justifiable the way I did it. <laughs> I did rationalize it, but there's a few things you can do with the dates to make sure it's just going in the right direction you want. <laughs> Too good. So we've talked about a couple of the major ways that people can manipulate stats either consciously or maybe they don't even realize that they've done this. We've talked about how the sample that you pick to do your study needs to be very carefully selected. We've talked about which averages, are you talking about the median or the mean? And we've talked about the, the semi-attached figure, just if you can't prove something, just do something else and pretend that it's the same thing. Now we want to talk about how do you actually fight back when there's all these dodgy stats thrown at us? How can we as you know, an, an innocent and honest member of the public, how can we see through the crap and see the truth behind all of this? So if you ever see statistics that look a little bit funny and they're a little bit off, there's five questions you can ask. The first is, who says so? And look for bias. And who, who's the person and what is their self-serving thing they're trying to do through these statistics? Mm. And no one wants to look bad in any circumstance. So, just number one, what are they trying to achieve? Correct. If it's me as the digital marketing specialist and then magically all the website stats have gone up, Always. You, need to, you need to look through and, and work out what's the incentives here. Similar, he's got one here of you know that 27% of doctors smoke throaty cigarettes. You've got to realize who funded that study. If throaty cigarettes funded that research, then there's a bit of bias in that inherently. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of that, uh, that you know, climate change. There is research out there that shows it's a crock of shit. But dig down who's funding that research as well <laughs> and what is, their, what is their bias and, you know, based on that, you can get to the results. Correct. So, who says so is a big question to ask. Another important question is how do they know? And if they've done a little survey but only 5% of people respond to the survey, how do they really know? That's a pretty dodgy, pretty dodgy set of statistics there. Yeah, it's a very low number. 95% aren't joining in. That yeah. 5% are probably doing it for some kind of reason. <laughs> exactly. The next question, what's missing? A little bit like our semi-attached figure, if they say something like, our product provides 40% greater customer satisfaction, uh, yeah, compared to what? There. Yeah, there's something missing there. They haven't given you the full like picture. You could say 40%, you could say more than a slap in the face. <laughs> You'd slap in the face and say, hey, was this product better than that? <laughs> exactly. It's pretty easy to, it's pretty easy to get that. He's, there's another one here, again, probably hasn't aged that well, but uh, 100% of American leaders hate black people, but if that survey was the leader of the KKK and they had one respondent, then 100% of those people do hate black people. So, that's a, that's a poorly conducted study, very, isn't it? Very poor study. Another question you can ask, did somebody change the subject? So, that's like that semi-attached figure, you know, that you're saying, does your medicine cure colds? And they said, yeah, we killed 30,000 germs. They've changed the subject a little bit there. Yeah. And I think finally, does it make sense? And this is the biggest one. You need to look at it and mm. is it logical if Astro every month is making up some reason why stats, <laughs> the website traffic just going up and going up and going up and then over six months, you look at the actual numbers and you go, hang on, mate, that's, it's not going up. How are you doing this? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> well, he's got here that a, a urology group, they were looking for, for a bit of funding and they said that there are, uh, from our studies, there are 8 million cases of prostate cancer in the US. But at the time, you know, men over 50 is obviously the biggest risk of prostate cancer. There was only 6 million men over the age of 50 at this time. So, how could they have uh, 8 million cases of prostate cancer if there's only 6 million people? That means that more than one prostate per person. So, it's a bit, bit dodgy, obviously. That one doesn't make sense. Or some people might be out there just committing some wild extrapolations. They might sound a little bit convincing and also unrealistic. People say things like, oh, if this rate of growth continues for the next 10 years, eventually our products will have 100% market share. A lot of people do that. They do the hockey stick thing that goes into yeah. infinity. 
But things, trees just don't grow to the moon, do they? It just can't go exactly. up forever. And some say it's going to slow down and, and not just keep going. <laughs> Actually, uh, going back to the podcast stats, I remember on the spreadsheet that we got for each month, you had the extrapolations as a you know percentage growth. If we've gone from 100 per month to 300 per month to 600 per month, if we extrapolate that, soon we're going to be on 10 billion downloads. <laughs> yeah, it's, we'll be knocking out Rogan. <laughs> it's, so, you've got to be very careful with these stats. So in summary, be very careful when people throw stats on you. There are so many ways you can bullshit and you might be bullshitted. And there's always that opportunity to be the bullshitter if you're that way inclined. This month, we are featuring some of the listeners of the What You Will Learn podcast. As you would have heard a little plug at the start of this episode, we sent out an offer in our monthly email to anyone with a a podcast, a book, a side hustle, a side project, a side business, something that we want to feature what you guys are up to as well. Every month, we send out an email. We'll do a little recap of the month gone by. We'll each give our ratings out of 10. We'll give you a sentence or two on what we really thought of the book. Uh, and plus, from time to time, little opportunities and little offers like this to be featured on the show uh, and an update of what's going on in our worlds. If you want to be one of the people to get first access to some of these new initiatives, jump on the email list, whatyouwillearn.com slash email, and that next email will come your way at the start of the month.